As part of National LGBT History Month, Sir Derek Jacobi, star of TV, film and theatre, visited the Museum of London to read to local children. I spoke to him after the readings, but first, let's eavesdrop on one of the stories. Hello, good afternoon. I hope you like being read to. I, as a child, love being read to. Um, and I think maybe, I always knew I was, I was going to be an actor anyway, uh, right from that high. And I always knew I was uh, uh, different from, from other boys. And of course, I grew up in, um, I was born in the 30s. I grew up in the 40s. So I've kind of seen it all in my life. And um, the journey that we've taken, the journey we've gone on, has been quite remarkable, quite remarkable. So, hello, kids. Hello. Now, the first story, have you got it up there? Is called 10,000 Dresses. Every night, Bailey dreamed about dresses. A long staircase led to a red Valentine castle. On each stair was a brand new dress, just waiting to be tried on. 10,000 dresses in all, and each one different. The first dress was made of crystals. When Bailey slipped the dress on, the crystals clinked against each other like millions of tiny bells. And when sunlight hit the dress just right, rainbows jumped out. So Derek Jacobi, uh, good afternoon. Very nice to see you here. Um, can you tell me what you're doing here at LGBT History Month? I was asked by um, Sue to um, come and replace, in fact, Ian McKellen, um, who couldn't make it today. So I'm, I'm the understudy today um, to read some um, stories, children's stories, to the kids, um, which I've just done and enjoyed it tremendously, tremendously. Mum, I dreamt about a dress, said Bailey. Uh-huh said her mother. A dress made of crystals that flashed rainbows in the sun. Uh-huh. And I was wondering if you could buy me a dress like that. Bailey, what are you talking about? You're a boy. Boys don't wear dresses. But I don't feel like a boy, Bailey said. Well, you are one, Bailey, and that's that. Now go away. And don't mention dresses again. Thinking of my own childhood, yes. um, a child growing up in the, in the 40s and 50s, um, and how you know, one did feel, I'm not quite sure who I am or what I am, where I am, um, and now it is so much easier for the children and the more we talk about it, the more it becomes not a taboo subject, the more it is out there in, in, in the open and talked about and accepted and um, it's wonderful. Very recently Ian McKellen and I were at the Grand Marshals at the New York Gay Pride Parade and uh, it was that weekend that the Supreme Court um, said yes to gay marriage. So it was an extraordinary weekend, and, and you know, I thought then the, the, the distance travelled since I was uh, a child, wondering what was going on inside me. Well, we had the pleasure of uh, seeing his company as well uh, at Manchester Pride. Um, do we think that there's any chance that we might be able to see you there soon? Maybe next year? Why not? I've done my first Pride. Um, you know, I'm I'm so out that I mean, there's no way back in it's, yeah absolutely yes i, I love manchester because i um i work, i do a, a drama series which is based up in manchester so i live up there for about 10 12 weeks of the year you once played alan turing uh in the tv film breaking the code um now alan turing's received a pardon uh, but there are still thousands of men out there who haven't received anything like that at all. Um, what do you think should be done about that? Yeah, well, I, th I, I think he should have received an apology rather than a pardon. He, he didn't do anything wrong. I mean, what are they pardoning him about? Um, apologise to him for what they did to him. Yes, absolutely. But how, how strange that um, someone like um, Alan, who uh, was had up for gross indecency, 
uh, was given the choice of a prison sentence or treatment. He chose treatment. And the treatment he chose, which um, they inserted a, um, a capsule of estrogen, a fed estrogen into his system, into his thigh, yeah. that was considered a punishment. That now helps to cure men of prostate cancer. Okay, he was a, in a sense a celebrity, um, a very extraordinary man, whose, whose work actually um, curtailed the, the Second World War, I think, quite definitely. Um, all, the, all the men of his generation who suffered um, and were, had to live below the radar, couldn't fulfill themselves or their lives. Of course they require an apology, not a pardon, never a pardon, because they did nothing wrong. They need an on-your-knees apology, yes. Now that we have equal rights and gay marriage, uh, what value do you think there is in looking back at LGBT history? I think they know most people now, I would think, uh, in this country anyway, uh, know uh, about um, homosexuality um, in both sexes and accept it, talk about it, and to an extent welcome it in that they are quite happy to live side by side with um, people that um, a few decades ago they would run a mile from and would imprison and you know pretend didn't exist and an event like today i mean you know just with uh, those stories to those kids you know it's wonderful that those kids because they're going to grow up with no sight at all totally accepting in a sense, it's early days because we're kind of uh, making up for centuries <laughs> of abuse, um, um, and there is still there is still a way to go. But my goodness, we've come such a journey since I was a kid. Well, as an actor, you've been in a profession um, that's been more accepting of sexuality uh, throughout the years. Yes. Why do you think that there is such an acceptance within the theatrical world? I, I, I suppose it is because we um, actors um, have to be truthful. They have to be honest about themselves and about what they're doing. If, if we, we are like um, playing Turing, you know, one fed on aspects of one's own homosexuality. And uh, we have to be open to everything. And uh, because actors are in, in performing, they are raw nerves and they're acting through and on their emotions, um, there is no desire to hide anything. Um, it, the desire is to present rounded, living, breathing, real human beings in the unreal context of a camera or a stage. But uh, what the audience see, they've got to accept as totally real. Um, and uh, I think that's why actors are so open. Uh, it's a great club to belong to, acting. The fact that I am myself gay doesn't mean that uh, I cannot put my uh, spirit, my heart, my head, my belief into somebody who is straight. I mean, I wouldn't put on big butch walks and I mean, that's as bad as a, a heterosexual actor trying to camp it up, mm. you know. Um, no, as I say, uh, uh, human beings are rounded, whether they're gay, straight, bi, whatever, they are human beings. Um, and they don't play, uh, there is no need to play to stereotypes. That's one of the things I think that this, this movement is now getting rid of. We are not stereotypes, we are all things. You and Sir Ian starred in the ITV sitcom Vicious. Um, what made you accept the role and did playing alongside Sir Ian uh, make it easier? Oh, I loved it. Very easy. Very easy. Um, you know, I think we were, <laughs> when we were, I don't know if he's ever told you, when we first asked to do it, um, it's an American writer and, uh, and Ian and I share an agency and uh, we were both phoned up and said, uh, there's this idea. And the original title 
was vicious old queens. <laughs> and I rang Ian and I said, have they talked to you about vicious old queens? And we soon came to the conclusion that uh, we wanted to do it, we'd love to do it, but not with that title. Because mm -hmm. uh, it really gave us nowhere to go, really. Um, so they decided to cut out old queens. And, you know, we've known each other for over 50 years and uh, we just, uh, we have confidence in each other and trust in each other and, and delight in each other's company. So, you know, if he got more laughs than I, I got, then um, I'll see him out back afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> if you could play any gay character in history, uh, what character would you like to play and why? I was asked um, and I, uh, I didn't accept it because I didn't. I think it was. I thought it was miscasting. Um, because I, I don't know whether they're still going to do it. But um, a film about Daniel Aru oh. um, in in the later years, um, um, and I adored Danny. I knew him well, and uh, he was a great, great performer. But I don't think I was the right casting. So, and I would hate to. Uh, in a sense, misrepresented. I had to let him down. Yes. So I said, I said no, but he would be one that I would, if I had the talent, I would love to play. Yeah. If someone made a biographic film of your life, who would you like to play yourself? Oh, it'd have to be Leonardo, wouldn't it? <laughs> Yeah. I think so. It's, I can see the similarities. <laughs> yes. They're strikingly similar, yes. 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 Uh, you once played the master, Doctor Who's uh, time adversary. Um, if you had a TARDIS for real and you could go back in time, what would you say to the younger Derek Jacobi in Cambridge? Cambridge? I would say, apropos of what we're talking about, stop worrying. Stop worrying, you're not alone. Not on your own. Um, and get on with your life. Stop angsting about who you fancy. <laughs> um, so Derek Jacobi, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. My great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.